when the Christchurch and Canterbury earthquakes hit in 2010 and 2011, Mark Quigley was the University of Canterbury's Associate Professor in Active Tectonics and Geomorphology. He's now at the University of Melbourne, but the man who was perhaps the most often seen scientific commentator on what was happening beneath Canterbury knows the plates under the South Island so well. What's happening here, I asked him. Um, yeah, so this, this particular event is an, is an offshore, uh, looks like it's got an offshore earthquake trace, so this is something um, that we haven't uh, mapped in a lot of detail, although there's been some seismic reflection surveys done offshore in this area that have probably imaged parts of this fault. Um, but yeah, this is a whopper. I mean, a magnitude 7.8 earthquake. We're looking at something that's um, over 200 kilometers long, um, something that's slipping four meters or more um, in the in the largest amount of slip area, um, and a really you know big long earthquake as a result. So yeah, quite a scary thing to be involved in. And way way bigger than the September 2010 or February 2011 quakes. Yeah, by magnitude. So remember, every time you go up one point in magnitude, you're releasing 32 times energy, and the seismic waves are roughly 10 times as high. So, yeah, so there would have been big rolling waves sent out from this earthquake all the way around. A lot of that sort of real hot, intense, high-frequency energy that we felt in Christchurch after the February earthquake would have dissipated um, by the, before it actually got to Christchurch, so the earthquake would have felt quite differently. But because it's deeper and it's a much bigger fault, um, it would have, the shaking would have lasted a lot, a lot longer. And I, I'm just looking at some of the data at the moment, and, and the energy was released over a period of going up to almost 120 seconds. So we're talking about two minutes of energy release while this fault is rupturing. And that's what people are describing, and that is new and once again in a different magnitude from what we've previously experienced. Yeah, so I think, I think some of the key elements here are going to be that, yes, there's probably going to be some liquefaction along the coast. Um, yes, there's certainly going to be some rock falls, particularly, um, you know, rock falls and landslides, particularly along the east coast up in the northern area um, around Blenheim um, and, and around uh, Kaikoura and all those sort of coastal areas there. I'd expect, you know, liquefaction places like, um, you know, coastal areas and things like that where the sediments are susceptible. And lots and lots of aftershocks, of course, right? Because when we have a magnitude 7.8 earthquake, which is what the USGS is reporting it at the moment, we're expecting several magnitude 6s. And for each magnitude 6, we're expecting 10 magnitude 5s. So let's say we get four, four or five magnitude 6 aftershocks from here. That's 40 or 50 magnitude 5s in the region. And they'll be spread out all over the place. So there'll be lots of local effects again, you know, lots of earthquakes feel like they're quite close to you, lots of, you know, you know, some, um, secondary uh, rock falls and, and things like that. So it's quite a big event seismologically for the South Island. And a psychologically difficult event to cope with because the, the aftershocks are just coming thick and fast. And as you say, they are big aftershocks. Yeah. Yeah, and let's not, of course, just, just focus on... Um, on people in the in the Wellington and Christchurch areas, but you know the the main amount of slip and the biggest amount of energy released from this earthquake is along that east coastal area that's actually already been affected by several big earthquakes in the last little while, and you know in, in the Seddon area and and Lake Grasmere area and things like that. So for those people, it'll be really quite traumatic, I would I would imagine. And um, yeah, I mean uh, the, the 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 earthquake seismologically is quite interesting because I would I would expect that there will be a little bit of coastal uplift as well. So I think some of the East Coast, um, in addition to having a, um, a little bit of tsunami activity, the, the East Coast might actually lift upwards a little bit as a result of this earthquake, because it gets a little bit closer to North America, the, the eastern coast of the South Island. Can you, can you explain that? Can you elaborate on that? When you say lift up, are we talking onshore, offshore, the whole area? And what kind of lift are you thinking we might see? Well, so this is an earthquake. Uh, it, it's, we, we would call this a, an oblique, um, a, oblique reverse fault earthquake. And so the fault, um, the top of the fault, likely resides just off the east coast of the of the northern South Island. But the fault dips back and underneath and beneath the northern part of the South Island. And because of the way that the fault is oriented, it's so, sort of striking um, northeast southwest. It's being squeezed as a result of the plate boundary. So it's kind of you know, a crude definition of the plate boundary um, between the Pacific and the, and the Australian plates. And so the, south, the northern South Island, which a lot of it resides on what we would refer to as the um, Australian plate, 
um, is being squeezed and, and pushed up over this. Um, you know, the main fault is the hope fault. Uh, that's the biggest fault that runs through that area. Yeah. But this thing's slightly oblique to that. The hope fault's primarily strike slip. It moves side to side, whereas this thing's oriented in such a way that the rocks are being squeezed and pushed up over top of each other. So as a result of that, the northern part of the South Island will actually move up relative to the offshore area, and that's what would have caused the tsunami. This earthquake was extraordinary. Mark Quigley talking from Melbourne.